You're listening to the Leading Healthy Creative Teams podcast with Matt Curtis. This is the podcast that helps you take your creative team from wherever you are today to healthy and effective. I want to focus on the human beings on the team this week. Any framework that you use to lead will fail if you don't pay attention to the human beings on your team. Doesn't matter if you fry chicken for a living. Doesn't matter if you manage a Fortune 100 business or really anywhere in between. Humans are not pawns. That is not what we were created to be. And so when we shift to this mindset of humans are pawns moving forward our mission, we got problems. So a major, a major part of this really is coming back to understanding how the human beings on your team work. What is it that they need? What is it that is their strengths and their weaknesses? A lot of this outlook for me started when I was really pretty new to managing a team. All of culture seemed to be anti-millennial. But I would look around and my team that was made up entirely of millennials, were, they were doing an incredible job. So I realized that what was happening is people were willing to substitute human beings for a label. And so they were willing to say, this group of people is bad or is lazy or is whatever, is entitled, as opposed to saying, what about this human being that's sitting in front of me? What are the things that they need? How can I, how can I help them be as effective as possible? What I want to talk about today is not letting labels guide your decision making. I, I want you to have a healthy team. And if you rely on labels, then you're going to have an unhealthy team fast. <laughs> so with that, I'm bringing on uh, a guest that I'm very excited to talk about. Her name is Laura Howe. And she is uh, she's the founder of an organization called Hope Made Strong. And their focus is on helping churches develop a culture of care. On top of that, Laura is the force behind the Church Mental Health Summit. It's a free one-day conference that I'm going to put a link in the show notes. I, I really want you to attend. It's free. It's one day. All the videos are on demand. It's not like there's a hardline schedule, uh, but it's going to be a really, really good thing. I'm speaking on navigating creative burnout. And so if that's something that you have wrestled with or are concerned about in your life, I would love to have you join me for that. If that doesn't compel you, there are 59 other sessions happening. There's a ton of amazing content all focused on the topic of mental health. Check out the show notes. You're going to find a link in there, and I would love to see you there. Let's get to the conversation with Laura. Thank you so much for joining me for this conversation. I want to hear a little bit about your background, how you started in, in really both things, the conference, but also the, the business that you're running, the organization. So give us a little bit of background so everyone kind of understands context. Yeah, I am so thankful to be here and to have this conversation with you. Uh, I'm excited because I've been on the clinical side and on the receiving side of burnout. I shouldn't say receiving, but I've experienced burnout. And and so having these conversations is really um, exciting for me. For the past 15 years, I've been a clinical social worker in the mental health and addictions area. Um, up here in Canada, our healthcare system's a wee bit different, <laughs> but um, in community health, mostly in in, in, in supporting, you know, anyone in the community, whether they are homeless to executives, just supporting people so that they can maintain their well-being. And uh, about 10 years into it, I started really struggling with burnout and compassion fatigue or feeling weary because of all the sadness and stories I was hearing. And um, I started, I don't know whether it was a God moment, we're just going to say that, that cliche, it was Jesus, <laughs> altar moment, where God really showed me how in my work, I'm trained to keep an eye out for burnout or see where things are starting to impact my well-being from helping others. But in the ministry world, when you're serving other people and you're constantly looking at needs and serving others, there's a misunderstanding that what you're experiencing when you're feeling fatigued or you're feeling overwhelmed or you're feeling resentful or numb, that those are problems of the person, not a result of the service work that you're doing. And so that just lit a fire in me and started Hope Made Strong. And so what I do in Hope Made Strong is I help churches develop care programs and care ministries to serve others, but they do it without burning out. And we do it in a systematic way. And we can talk about that later if we need to. Uh, but that led me to the Church Mental Health Summit. And the summit was started off as a campaign, just something simple to honor World Mental Health Day and to continue the conversation about how it's so important for the church to be speaking and and talking about mental health and creating safe places for people to feel welcomed and to find healing 
uh, turned into a summit that has grown quite quickly. This is going to be our third year. And last year we saw over 3000 people. It was viewed across wow. 75 countries, which is the oh, most amazing. wild thing. I had to Google what some of these countries were. I've never even heard of them. So that was really exciting, but it's telling that so many people are like, okay, this is a real thing and we need to figure it out because people are coming to the church for help. Yeah, I love that. I That's something that I've experienced in my own life where it, it's really easy to kind of nestle the idea of mental health into this category of it's not mine. It doesn't belong to me. Yeah. I don't see it or feel it. And so therefore, maybe it's not as real as everybody's claiming it is. And I think I think that's a problem. And I think what what unfor un unfortunately what happens often is that we discover its realness when it's like upon us mm. and we kind of disregard some of the steps that we can take to avoid whether it be burnout or in some cases even just like uh, this this acute mental collapse almost, yeah. you know, that that puts us in a really bad spot. So yeah, over the last couple of years, there's been a, a tremendous amount of pressure, especially on churches to adapt and change and shift and tomorrow adapt and change and shift and all yep. like just twists and turns. And, and what research is telling us is especially those in clergy or who serve in ministry, if you were doing well, at the beginning of the pandemic, if you were doing well and you were thriving and you were healthy, likely you are doing well now. Mm -hmm. However, if you were on the edge or you were struggling with anxiety or you're feeling weary or burnout, or if you were, maybe you were even on the edge, likely now you are feeling it maybe daily, or it's no longer just at work, but it's also at home or in your friendships or in your, or in your physical body. Uh, it seems like there's been an incubator and whatever was, you know, on the edge or experienced before the pandemic has now just grown. And yeah. so I think a lot of people are feeling or what I'm hearing is that a lot of people are noticing that mental health and I would love to talk about the difference between mental health and mental illness. But yeah. mental health is no longer an issue of others, but mm -hmm. it's an issue for all of us. We all yeah. experience some sort of impact of yeah. mental health. Yeah, that's a great distinction because that's, I yeah, I mean, I saw that a lot because, you know, I'm serving on a church staff during the pandemic, overseeing online ministry and a creative team. And so mm -hmm. all of a sudden, I remember the, the senior <laughs> pastor, I mean, it was a, it was a ha ha funny moment passing joke. And then as you look back, you're like, that was, that was way more true than I wish it was. But he said, well, congratulations, Matt, on being the senior pastor of the church. You know, our plan was for a couple weeks, we'll be online only. Yeah. Yeah. That's everyone's so, plan. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Everybody <laughs> thinks this is a short game thing. And I just remember feeling the weight of that. Mm. And I think you know, you talk about this, um, almost like this care overload, so focused on the care and concern of the other people that, that you're caring for, that you're, mm -hmm. you're trying to help through these things. You end up sort of taking a piece of each of those cares and concerns on you and you hold mm -hmm. them. And so I would see on a weekend, a bunch of prayer requests coming in and it's like, this is too many prayer requests for me to navigate. Now there was a team to help distribute the load, but but I had to work really hard personally yeah. to not hold on to them because I cared for the people, you know. So so there's there's definitely this ballooning of care that can happen that mm -hmm. that I think clergy in particular, I would say probably clergy and then nonprofits in certain contexts can really become overwhelmed quickly by the the needs, the scope of needs that happen. I really appreciate this distinction. Let's talk a little bit about the mental health versus mental illness. I don't I, I don't know if there's a clear distinction in most people's minds. So what what does that look like? Well, mental health is something everyone has. Mental health is health. It's how are you doing physically, emotionally, mentally, um, relationally? How are you doing? And in, in your it, it, mental health uh, bleeds over, or you know, has a ripple effect into many different areas of your of your well being. And and when you talk about mental health, everyone has mental health, and it's on the spectrum of whether it's poor or whether it's thriving and 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 flourishing. And so. I think when someone talks about mental health, I think we need to recognize that everyone has these up and down days. And for the most part, having up and down days 
is good. That means you're healthy and you're navigating life challenges and there's going to be good moments and bad moments. But mental illness is something that is more pervasive. It's more chronic or long lasting and long standing. And, and it requires more of a treatment plan. It requires supports like you would have a, any chronic illness. I have an autoimmune disorder. I have friends who have diabetes. These are chronic illnesses or, or struggles that their body is not functioning as it was intended. And so when you have a mental illness, it means your body is not functioning as it intended and you are requiring more support, whether that's counseling or talk therapy, whether that's medications, whether it's psychiatry or, or treatment where you would, um, you know, seek treatment, whether you'll stay there for a period of time or not. And I think there's, um, to distinguish the differences between mental illness and, and mental health isn't to create divide or separation or an us and them. What it is, is to honor the struggle or honor the challenges that those who have, who have mental illness have and, and to see that their ability to overcome a, uh, their body not functioning or operating as properly is a strength for them. Those are the people who, when they feel junky or when they're feeling down or they're feeling overwhelmed, they have an ability, they have been forced to learn these coping and these skills that are tremendous strengths and we can really learn from them, but being able to offer grace so that they have space to learn those at the same time. And then mental health, recognizing that we all have mental health. We all have good days and bad days. And that doesn't mean uh, you're a sinner or you've done something wrong or you're a bad father or a bad leader. It really just means you are human and you're just navigating life. Yeah, that's great. One of the, one of the things that I find with our culture is we are, we are looking for the maximum capacity that a human can handle mm -hmm. and we just keep pushing. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, for me coming from a design space, I look at even the tools that I use. What I started using in college, it's named the same thing. It's still Photoshop, but Photoshop over the years has reduced the amount of time that I have to spend on a certain task. And so, I mean, yesterday's a great example. I had something that would normally have taken me maybe three hours and it took me probably 15 seconds. Wow. And so on the surface, it's like humanity is achieving great <laughs> feats. Look how much extra time. That means I have two hours, you know, almost three full hours so that I could just lounge in the chair and, you know, have a, have a beverage and a coconut brought to me. Like what a life I'm living. Well, the problem is now I have a thousand of those tasks stacked up. Mm -hmm. And so there's still a mental capacity and a mental even limitation. And I feel like as we keep getting faster and faster in our culture, this is, this is where I think this conversation becomes so important because we've sort of, I think there's a general sense that the mental illness group is sort of off in some corner somewhere. And then the mental health thing is sort of this like facade for like, I'm having a bad day. Mm. But, but I think that, you know, I love what you're saying. It's the same as physicality. Like if I'm, if I'm running, you know, I was joking with my kids the other day, I'm not in the best shape. So if I said, I'm going to run a marathon tomorrow, <laughs> that's a very bad decision. <laughs> but if I said, I want to run a marathon in a year, mm -hmm. then it gives me steps to be able to guard my body ultimately mm -hmm. from collapse in the process of preparing for something that will be extremely taxing. And so mm -hmm. this is what, you know, I've, I've seen this as the mental illness side is closer to me than, you know, than I think to, to some, to many, I don't know <laughs> what the numbers say, but um, to see the amount of energy that needs to go into somewhat simple tasks, that's mm -hmm. the perception. But I really appreciate what you're saying about there is a, there is a lot to learn. And I know for me personally, I have learned what tenacity, what resilience, mm -hmm. what really just, I mean, it sounds weird to say power, but like, it's a really impressive feat yes. to see the, the, the size of the mountains that need to be overcome. And there's also this complexity of the rest of the world doesn't really get it. You know what I mean? Nobody else looks around and says, oh yeah, that's a hard task. I've really appreciated being exposed to that side of, of life because it's helped me recognize that everyone's really playing with a, a different kind of hand. Mm -hmm. And so I think there's been an assumption historically, everybody has the same hand or you maybe are better, but, right. but you know, so there's, there's a lot more kind of gradation in life than maybe we've, we've kind of given yeah. honor to or, or recognize. I think that distinction is really helpful for us to understand. With that even kind of being established, you know, I'm thinking through this in, in the context of a healthy team, specifically a healthy creative team. I feel like 
the creative industry is particularly good at burning people out and <laughs> taxing people. I mean, I read about one creative, uh, her routine was to go take a job for three years and just, I mean, pedal to the metal and then functionally burn out and then take a year off and recover. Like she would go to a cabin and mm. write by hand. Like, I mean, that was, that was the extreme that she wow. needed to go to. And then after that period of time, she's like, I'm ready to do it again. And I'm just thinking, Oh, that seems really extreme. But, but it was an indication to me that the, that there is a, an unhealthy pace that exists okay. within a creative industry. And this is not the claim. It's not everywhere. I think it is a lot of other places too, but, but specifically in the context of a team, you know, I'd love to talk a little bit about just, I mean, what does it look like to be an employee? What does it look like to be a leader? Or what does it look like to lead someone who's wrestling in this space? And so we probably don't have enough time to go through both the mental illness and the mental health mm -hmm. side of things. But I'd love to just kind of talk through, you know, if you're an employee on a team and you wrestle with either, you know, mental illness or you're in a season where you feel like your mental health isn't what it, you know, should be. What does it look like to really sort of advocate for yourself? You know, my goal here is really to get to the leader so that the the employee doesn't have to advocate for themselves, but they have a partner in this. But what does it look like for an employee, you know, from your vantage point to really represent themselves well and to care for their health, to prioritize mm -hmm. that in the midst of work? Can I pick up on a key word that you said there, resilience? Yeah. Could we, can I use that as kind of the jumping off part? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Because resilience can be this cliche word. It's kind of like that work-life balance. Like everyone's like, oh, that sounds great, but what the heck is that? And is it yeah. even possible? And resilience is kind of getting that same reputation where you hear motivational speakers and leadership people, oh, we need to be resilient. We need to teach resilience in our team, but we're not really quite sure what that is. And I think this is something we can apply a couple practical things that will be both help from a leader's perspective perspective as well as an employee's perspective. Mm. So from how I see resilience is resiliency is like a muscle that you use. And it's not something that you can achieve and that you put it on a plaque and you hang it up on your wall and you're like, okay, I achieved resilience. I have done X, Y, Z to achieve that. But it really is something that if you don't use it, you'll lose it. If you don't work at it or strengthen it, you're going to lose it. And so I've developed um, seven keys or I, or I communicate that these keys are not something I've developed. You're probably going to roll your eyes when you hear them because they're like, oh, I've heard that before. Please don't tell me to exercise. But these seven keys are something that are what you can do to actually exercise or build resilience. And the reason why I want to share them, and we don't have to go through all seven, I can just pick the top three, not top three, but the popular three, um, is because these are what people can do for themselves. Because sometimes when you're on a team and you're being given tasks and deadlines, you feel out of control. I can't control my circumstances. I can't control the deadline. I can't control this. I'm just expected to follow and perform. And that can be really powerless. Like you can feel like you have no out or you have no control. And so these are keys that can help you feel like you are doing something for yourself. And then as a leader, uh, these keys allow you, okay, how can I foster these or create space for these so that my team has an opportunity to be, to be resilient? That's fantastic. Because I think, I think that's really, you know, what I've seen just in, in our own sort of mental health or really mental illness journey is that, that this idea of having a voice, this idea of being able to be an advocate for yourself or to have somebody else who is an advocate for you. Those are really, really important things. And so what I've tried to kind of take from that and apply to my own leading contexts is I want everyone on my team to be able to have a voice. Mm -hmm. I want them to be able to advocate for themselves. I want to build a system that is nimble enough that can adapt to the reality of their day to day. So if somebody calls me and they say, hey, I'm not feeling well today, I want to have built a system that says you take care of yourself because I care about you as the human being yeah. more than I care about you as the you know cog in our machine. <laughs> and then we will figure out how do we take on the rest of that load together yeah. as a team so that so that the person who is in, in need of recovery they can, they can do that. And so I think that this feels like the sweet spot of the conversation to say both ends, you know, <laughs> this is what the employee needs, but then also leader, 
This is what you, you can do gonna, for you. Yeah, that's right. You're going to need yeah. to build this. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. So yeah. Okay. Cool. All right. Well, the first one I want to talk about is staying connected. And often when we're feeling down and um, having a crummy day, we want to isolate ourselves. We don't want to be the downer. We don't want to be the party pooper. And so we really just isolate ourselves or we don't want to pass on our problems to other people or we, you know, we, 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 and we're exhausted. We skip out, you know, shop night or the, or the game or book club or whatever it might be. You skip out on those things because you're exhausted and you don't just, you don't feel like being around people anymore. You don't want to hear any of the things. But staying connected is absolutely key to building resilience. It allows other people to build hope into us, to provide encouragement. And I want to say this was one of my red flags that went up when I was struggling with burnout and, and, and fatigue is that I would isolate myself. And so if you are noticing that you are wanting to isolate and to pull away and you want to be by yourself, that is the red flag telling you you're going down, you're not you're not not going downhill like you're falling off a cliff and you're gonna you know you know not but it is an a red flag identifying that you know you're not your best right now so stay try to stay connected or prioritize those times where you can be together so i would say staying connected is key so let me ask you this question Mm -hmm. what about the introverts (laughs) who are like i was connected all day (laughs) i would love to not be connected for just a little bit you know (laughs) yes and and that's when i would say if it's anything outside of your norm so if normally you love to go out and do this one thing and then you're pulling away so it's a change in behavior so if normally you're with people all day and then you are like on your couch with your dog reading a book or watching the game Obviously, that's the normal behavior, but it's when you start to see a shift. For me, I girls' night is Thursday nights. My kids know it. My husband knows it. I'm out Thursday nights. Like, don't expect me to cook dinner. So, but that was starting to change when I was experiencing burnout. I would choose to stay home over going out. So there was a change of behavior. That's great. Yeah, that's helpful because so for me, most of my my connections are still on the West Coast, and now I'm on the East Coast, and so not every evening, but many evenings, I'll log on to a game and we'll play and we'll, you know, have conversations and be connected that way. I am introverted. So believe me, I choose that over a in-person thing (laughs) all day long. But, but if that starts to change, if I start to say, man, I am just so fried. I don't want to do this anymore. I need a break from this. That's when it's the Mm. beginning of, okay, I need to pay attention. Is that a fair kind of, I just want to make sure I'm representing the introverts. Yeah. Yeah. Oh no, absolutely. And I'm going to be honest, most people in ministry are introverts, which is shocking because you're around people all day, but I'm finding that most people are introverts because they um, like tasks and uh, they like either studying the word or they like to the behind yeah. the scenes. Right. So that makes sense. That makes sense. Um, the next one is self-care and please don't roll your eyes. There's a the, self-care gets a bad rap, but can I change self-care to eat, sleep, move? It's not it. green smoothies. It's not going for pedicures. It's not going for trips. Those are just, those are wonderful things and you could classify those as self-care, but really self-care is just tending to your own well-being, eating, sleeping and moving. Uh, how many times, like, I can't even tell you how many times I've eat my lunch consisted of a bag of chips and a bag of carrots. And I was like, sweet bone it. Like there's balance there. I'm just going to go with it. But, and, and at my desk while I'm working because the deadlines are there. And so eating on a, 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 like real lunch, a, like a real table is huge. <laughs> it, it, we don't, those little things that, you know, t- taking away time away from the the screen and just eating food and allowing our bodies to be fueled and having our minds to have that break and and praying over our meal to recenter our thoughts on God. Like those three things are very small in the moment, but when you compound those and make habits out of those, they are they are sustaining. They allow you to sustain through the deadlines and through the pressure that you have. That is a very profound challenge to the creative. <laughs> Because we have too much on our plate, yes. not literally, we have too much on our to-do list in order to get done. So we we often choose to work through lunch. Yeah. I read an article several years ago. I'll see if I can find it. If I can find it, I'll put it in the show notes. But it was a study, I believe it was done in the UK, and it was talking about those who took their 30-minute or hour, whatever duration lunch, actually accomplished more over the course of the day mm. than those who worked through their lunch and basically threw an extra hour into the pot. So they got done more in less time. And so to me, there's a connection there because I think about the well-being of my productivity even. Like if my mind is not working well, I do garbage work. 
Mm-hmm. And so <laughs> I've, I've kind of made a policy for myself. If I'm specifically, if I'm writing, I will not turn anything in until I sleep on it. Like that's mm-hmm. just a rule that I've built for myself. I just engaged a project this week. I looked at the work that I did late in the night. I just had, it was a really busy stretch and I looked at it the next day and I was like, I am so glad I didn't try to finish this because I missed so much. So I just want to really, really kind of drive that home for specifically for the creative group. Like this idea of eat is it's so, it's so easy to get into this. It just fuels my body so that I can create more aggressively Mm -hmm. or faster or higher volume. And it ends up sabotaging us. Yeah. And so you really have to make this a practice. And and this is this is honestly, this is purely from a like, if I'm your boss and I want the most most creativity, please take your lunch. But from a mental health perspective, it is critical to sustaining you over a long period of time. We yeah. fall into this trap of it is okay for us to continually compromise. And the problem is it's okay until it's not okay. And then yeah. when it's not okay, it is big, not okay. And now you've burned out, you're leaving your job, you hate everybody, like it becomes very, very problematic very quickly. So Mm -hmm. I love I want to hear the rest (laughs) of these too. But this one in particular, I just I see this pattern all the time. And I've lived it myself as a creative. We're really, um, we're really lazy about it's not even that we're lazy, I would say it's that we feel like that has been stolen from us. And so we're not allowed to do that. Mm -hmm. And so absolutely prioritize it because it's critical to your both mental health and your creative productivity. So yeah, yeah, good. Okay, keep going. Sleep is the next one. Right? Well, the sleep is <laughs> everyone knows sleep. So just yeah. go to bed, go get some sleep. Don't work late at night. And then moving where we sit so much, so, so, so much. So taking those opportunities to move. So self-care isn't these big fancy things. It's eat, sleep, move. It's really just tending to the basics. And I like what you said. It helps with the longevity. We're in a marathon here. Life is a marathon. It's not a sprint. So we really need to have those practices. And then the next one um, the, for the top three that I like to share is having fun. <laughs> in ministry, We everything is so serious. There's so many deadlines. We can lose the fun or the joy in our work. And so um, for me, when I was doing counseling, you know, eight hours a day, hearing people suffering and stories, we would have this survivor's guilt where I can't have fun because I've heard so many other people um, are suffering. How can I take a vacation day when I know people are needing me? And I think, you know, in a different context, the same vein is how can I have fun or how can I take vacation or how can I go home, not even early, but on time (laughs) and go and enjoy an evening when I know there are so many deadlines and people are needing me. But really it's that sustaining power when you can have fun and be creative. And that creativity is so unique to individuals. I'm not even going to say what it is. It's it's pretty much like, what did you like to do when you were eight years old? And then do that. Um, so good. that that's a good marker. And do that because that will actually breed and, flu- and, and, and incubate and like um, breed um, creativity in you so that you are more productive later. Yeah, that's great. One, I read a story of someone who burned out and he went through counseling. I mean, it was a, it was a very deep burnout. It wasn't the kind of like, oh, I just feel kind of burned out today. You know, that's, that's not actually what burnout even no. is, but that's different <laughs> as a whole different episode. <laughs> but, um, but one of the things that he was charged with, so as he, as he moved up the ladder and maybe this is even the transition to kind of the leadership perspective, but as he moved up the ladder he felt like he needed to give more and more time mm-hmm. to work. And so what happened was all of the hobbies that he did in his free time were kind of cannibalized by this additional investment in his work. And so one of the conclusions that they came to is he's like, I just, I love fishing, but it just, it takes time. You know, you got to mm-hmm. go out to the river, to the lake, and you got to be there for a couple of days. And like, like that was the type of fishing that he enjoyed. Right, right. And he re he reinserted that back in life and he reprioritized it. And I think it, and for him, that was that was transformational. It, right. it allowed him. What's interesting is it allowed him to remain at the level that he was. Yeah, I was having this conversation recently with my wife. I love hobbies, and so over the last several months, I've been focused on building a business. And so, like everything about all of my time <laughs> goes into how do I survive, <laughs> you know. And so, hobbies look like financial drains that I cannot swing right now, right. you know. So, so I'm I'm really light on the hobbies, but I'm starting to feel it. Mm-hmm. So I kind of made a passing coffee roast, uh, a passing comment. <laughs> Roasting coffee is one of the things that I really love doing. And my wife said to me, she's like, yeah, you could probably pick it up again, you know, if not now, probably pretty soon. And I was like, 
Oh, interesting. And so in a sense, she's advocating for yeah. me to make sure that I'm keeping fun as a part of my life. And it's a, it's a real perspective. It, it's a, it's a perspective threat maybe because we don't feel like we're able to do that mm -hmm. with all of the urgency, all, all of the projects, all of the things, you know, I call them fire drills, all of the fire drills that come into our life as creatives, we can't prioritize having fun. Mm -hmm. And so this to me, I'm not wired this way. I tend not to be like, sounds weird to say I'm not a fun guy. But like, I'm not a fun person I'm, either. Yeah. I'm going to make a great <laughs> old person. I like puzzles and reading. So yeah, perfect, perfect. <laughs> yeah, you're like, can I just, can I get there? Like when, when is I, when am I there? When have I arrived? Yes. You know? And so I'm not the throw a party guy. I'm yeah. not a, we planned this scavenger hunt around the campus. Yeah. You know, yeah. I always was annoyed. I had somebody yeah. and I feel bad that I'm this way, but Somebody celebrated my birthday at work and they put like glitter everywhere, like oh. happy birthday. And I walked in. This is an indicator of burnout, probably. You can <laughs> confirm this. But I walked in and I was like, I got too much to do to clean up this mess. Like, and, and what I was doing is I wasn't allowing myself to uh, experience fun and yeah. joy. And in that case, even like, it sounds weird to say it this way, maybe, but like honor, like somebody remembered and thought about me enough to put in effort to mm -hmm. celebrate my birthday mm -hmm. and my response was you know it was negative it was joyless you know it was finding all of the bad things and so man that's when i have to work on all the time is figuring out joy and so you know i love this i love this analogy or this even this charge what did you like doing when you were eight mm -hmm. i bought a lego set the other i mean this was a couple months ago and i just my my kids were into legos and i was like i haven't built a lego set in forever right. so i bought a lego set and i yes. built it and so it's i mean i think it's it feels like such a it, it feels like such an indulgence you know but i mean it wasn't it wasn't the lego set i wanted that was too expensive you know but but i mean even if it's something where you're playing yeah. you know yeah. do something build a fort that, go fishing yeah, ride just your have bike fun. yeah right, i knew right. someone that wanted to when they were 8 years old they would um redecorate dollhouses so they got oh, their wow. old dollhouse that they were saving for their grandchildren that were yet to come out of their attic and they renovated like redecorate so i was like good. this is and they said it was the most fulfilling thing yeah. in the evenings and it allowed their joy cup to be filled up yeah. so that tomorrow they were able to handle the the pressure yeah. and uh you know yeah. so as you're saying that sometimes i think god has gifted us in ways that we have we have shut down mm. and we have declared that these are not significant and yet we're gifted in these things and they feel, they feel meaningless when we judge them in light of eternity or whatever. But, but I, I really believe that God has given us these glimpses of joy because th that's a piece of how we experience who he is and how Absolutely. we understand who he is. Like not everything so, we do has to serve a financial right. or project person. Purpose. Right. We're, yeah. We're so yeah. focused on, how does what God give me benefit the world mm -hmm. around us? And we, we lose sight of the fact that our work is worship. Mm -hmm. We have the opportunity to praise the creator of the universe through the work that we do, through the gifts that he's given us. Mm -hmm. That's a real thing. <laughs> and so if we, you know, in the, in the creative arty, whatever, artsy fartsy world, as I call it, if you paint a painting that no one else sees, there's still value in that painting, Absolutely. not monetarily or whatever. Like that doesn't matter. That's actually a human layer that we put on top of things to judge worth. But if we're using our gifts and our skills to honor the creator and nobody else sees it, it doesn't matter. I mean, there's actually stories about that in scripture <laughs> about yeah. how maybe that's even better. So yeah. it's a, it's a good charge and a good reminder to don't, you know, don't allow the pace of your life or the pace of your work really to steal these joyful moments because these are truly the things that recharge us and refill us. Mm -hmm. So there's this, there's this beautiful loop that create, that it creates that refuels us to be able to create for work and then come home and then create for, you know, whatever. And so it's, it, it's a really important feeding of that system. Mm -hmm. So that's great. Why? Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, when I talk to people about these seven keys and there's a podcast on it, like there's, you know, there's a blog, like whatever there's seven, there's four other ones, but they, these ones, people just kind of roll their eyes saying, how is this going to impact my health? mental health? How is this going to transform my, my team? Like this isn't, these are just simple things, but I'm going to tell you, like you mentioned that this person that you knew that was in counseling and 
over and over and over, I would for 15 years would share with people, these are the foundations of well being. It's not doesn't have to be a magical wand. It's not some huge transformational process. It's you think if you have a problem of resentment and numbness and burnout that you think it's going to have to be a complicated solution. But really, it's the simple things the eating lunch at a desk at lunchtime, the the taking time to have fun and, and staying connected with those who fuel you, you think those would help? Absolutely. These are the foundations of well-being and these are transformational in you as an individual and you in your team. Yeah, that's fantastic. So then thinking through the lens of a leader, you know, my my first thought is like, okay, so then how do I start applying some of these mm-hmm. things? Anything that comes to your mind in terms of ways to encourage this? So now think, you know, I'm thinking through this of you have the conversation with the person who is burning out. You're sharing these ideas what do you wish their spouse, their significant other, uh, their boss, what do you wish those people were doing to help support and encourage these three steps and ultimately seven? I'm going to put a link. So I'll I'll need that from you. (laughs) Sure, will do. (laughs) I'll put a link to the blog and to the podcast of kind of this larger expansion of things. But so what would you what would you hope somebody's doing to help support these happening? I think you said your wife did that for you is, yeah, let's do it. Like, if this is something you enjoy, let's create space and time in our family schedule and allow this. If, if you're working as a team, as a leader, how can you, you know, have lunchtime? So there's no expectation that at 11 o'clock you're going in and asking for a project to be done by one, you know, things like that. It's just being mindful of your time and prioritizing your time, I think, is a huge thing. And if people are unsure or not confident, like, oh, I think that's stupid or silly or foolish or 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 maybe it's selfish for me to want to buy a Lego set or, you know, any of these things because our mind plays tricks on us. It's trying to steal, kill and destroy like the devil's in there trying to, you know, wear us down. Like, no, be the encourager, be the supporter and being like, no, this is really important. You are your best self when you are doing this. So let's do this more, you know, and I, th- I think that would be the simplest, um, although can feel the hardest, but it is the simplest way that we can encourage others. Yeah, that's great. I think, you know, I'm thinking through a kind of a practical application for those who are leading a creative team. So have a team lunch. Absolutely. Sort of mandate that everybody comes for yeah. work, you know, <laughs> but, yeah. but maybe it's not something you can afford to do every week, but you do it once a month, but you do yeah. something that essentially is modeling paper bag lunches bring yeah, your sure, own lunch yeah or yeah. bring your lunch and eat together as yeah. a team yeah and so you're you're modeling a behavior that you want to be adopted by the individual you know i think mm-hmm. it's a tricky one because if people don't have kids it's hard to see some of the parallels here but i'm thinking <laughs> through the lens of how do i raise my kids i'm trying to model for them what it looks like to do a lot of these things and so there was an era where people would um, people would sort of tout at least you know, speakers that I would hear at conferences like, oh, my kids don't know any of the problems that happen at work. I'm like, well, they're in trouble when they get a job because it's a dumpster (laughs) fire. And so (laughs) you have to be able to navigate these things. And so I'll share with them, obviously, with respect to privacy and the certain situations or whatever, but I will share with them some of the complexities that we have to navigate. And then I will hopefully (laughs) model for them what it looks like to take some of those things and put them on the shelf. Mm-hmm. and say, look, I know that I have a lot of deadlines right now, but I'm going to take a break. I'm even being convicted as we're talking. My son is going to be in a Pokemon tournament in a couple of weeks, and he's trying to hone in his deck. And I'm like, I don't really know what most of that means, but I know that's <laughs> happening. And and he's asked me a couple of times if I would help him test. And every time I've said, you know what, I'm just really slammed this week. And so I'm going to make it a priority in the next couple of days to disregard that and to say, you know what, I'm going to make time and, and mm-hmm. do this. And so I think that's the pressure. The pressure is, you know, that leadership's going to come into your office and they're going to hand you a bunch of tasks. So then your job as the leader is to figure out a way. I would argue that you can do this through better systems. That's, you know, a larger yeah. part of what I care yeah. about. But but how do you build in these protective elements for your team and how do you shield them from some of the 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 chaos that can you know, that, that can happen uh, in, in some of these contexts. And so I love that you've given us clarity on these three areas. And I know there's more, but these three areas that we can really be proactive about as leaders, but then also as employees, as individuals, as human beings, all of us, regardless of our level, these are things that we need to be prioritizing mm-hmm. as well. Mm-hmm. That's fantastic. 
So anything, anything else, just sort of a general word that you feel like is helpful in the, in the context of this conversation? Um, or is it, does this feel like it's, you know, sufficient, anything you'd like to just kind of charge people with when it comes to thinking about mental health versus mental illness, about applying it in your work, personal yeah. space, you know? I think we've had some really good conversation today. And, you know, when you think about um, taking those moments to reflect on yourself, um, the overused analogy is taking care of yourself before you take care of others. You know, that whole airplane mask, um, you have to put your own mask on first. Um, but what I think is we, we disregard some of the red flags that identify that we're not doing well. And we minimize those because we see that um, exhaustion is encouraged or it's a badge of honor to be weary and, and, you know, worn out. And, and I, I want to, a caution to say, you know, although that might um, be a great, uh, that might show up well when you're doing, you know, staff meetings and saying, look at all the things that we were able to accomplish. Um, that is a short race to burnout. And and burnout really is hopelessness, helplessness, and prolonged stress. It's that hopelessness of no control, helplessness, or helplessness that you have no control, hopelessness, like this is never going to end, and and long-term stress. And, and when you combine those three things, then you are on a fast track to burnout. And, and, and and so when you look at your team and when you look in your life, see, okay, where can I create space for hope? I This expectation of a break or this expectation of joy and fun and how can I manage my um, the helplessness or how can I control or, or support myself in these situations? And so those, I just want to encourage people to do the boring and maybe not so fun reflective work to figure out, okay, what are, what are my red flags identifying when I'm going down that path? For me, it was isolation. For others, it might be something different. And so I think that would be um, the key point because once you're, once you're down that path, you know, a little ways, it's harder to re- jump back. But if we can just un- un- reflect and be like, oh, this is, this is my red flag that I'm not doing well, I, I might need to prioritize a little bit more. Things, it could be things like I'm not sleeping well, or I don't have patience with my kids at the end of the day. I'm guilty of that. Um, isolating, you know, we've talked about that enough, but I just would really encourage people to self-reflect and identify those red flags so that they can support their own well-being. Yeah, that's great. I love it. I hope that that conversation was as helpful for you as it was for me. I really enjoyed hearing her insights. And I love these three practical things that we can be doing as leaders, but also as human beings, as individuals, employees, wherever you are on the spectrum, even if you're a CEO, even if you're running the whole show, a senior pastor, you're you're still a human being that's in need of being cognizant of caring for yourself. So I hope that these things are helpful for you. And I really hope to see you at the mental health summit let me know if you're going shoot me a message you can find me on socials Uh, i would love to connect with you there and uh, just kind of hear what you think about the presentation if you watch mine or even what you got from the summit thank you so much again for joining us on this longer than normal episode and we'll see you next week thanks for listening to this episode thanks for listening to this episode this podcast is just one of the ways lunchtime heroes lunchtime heroes help build stay up to date on the latest by signing up to date on the latest by signing up at lunchtimeheroes.com